All right, thank y'all for tuning in to this program. You're watching Your Journey with Andrew Love. And I have another special guest today. She's been a law enforcement, a former law enforcement for many, many years. And y'all probably seen on CNN, Fox, uh, TMZ, and other station of that sort. And um, she is a well-known officer, former officer. Her name is Cheryl Dorsey. And Cheryl Dorsey, I want you to introduce yourself uh, to the audience and tell a little bit about yourself. So uh, I'm a retired Los Angeles Police Department Sergeant. My name is Cheryl Dorsey. I served on the Los Angeles Police Department between 1980 and 2000 under the command of Police Chiefs Daryl Francis Gates, Willie Williams, and Bernard Parks. In 2013, there was an incident here in California involving a fired Los Angeles Police Department officer by the name of Christopher Dorner. Many of you may know his story. You can Google his name for more. I won't go much into detail, but at the end of the day, Christopher Dorner um, was involved in the death of four people. He was um, grieved by the LAPD and thought that he had been treated unfairly. And in the pursuit of him for these deadly shootings that he was engaged in, there was a lot being said on the media with regards to him being disgruntled, him being unfit. And many of my colleagues along with myself knew that LAPD, when they ever found him, would execute him. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about how I thought Christopher Dorner came to create this manifesto that ultimately went public. What made him do something that probably is very foreign to who he was as a person? But more importantly, I knew that everything that Christopher Dorner talked about in his manifesto to be true because I had experienced a lot of the discrimination, retaliation, reverse racism on the LAPD as he had only 15 years earlier. I didn't know Christopher Dorner, and let me be clear, I do not condone what he did, but I understood how he got pushed to do what he did. And so I wrote my first book, Black and Blue, The Creation of a Manifesto. That was in 2013. And then in 2014, the very following year, there were a spate of deadly police shootings and uses of force. Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Ezell Ford here in Los Angeles, Tamir Rice. And I realized that I was in a very unique position because I could speak to uses of deadly force by police officers based on my training and experience and explain why in some instances I thought that shouldn't happen. And so that led to my second book, Black and Blue, the creation of a social advocate. Yes, I see your uh, Black and Blue in the background. I like it, what I'm seeing. And um, man, um, would you like to share a little bit info about the Black and Blue at all? Just yeah, sure. Bit. So uh, Black and Blue is um, a compilation. There are three volumes, and it deals with my own personal experiences. It's autobiographical. Uh, volume one and two are similar in that it deals with my 20-year career on the Los Angeles Police Department. And then in volume two, the revised version of volume one, I start talking a little bit more about my advocacy work that I began in 2004 as a result of all the uh, deadly uses of force that I talked about earlier. So I talk a lot about um, what's wrong. We already know if you look like me, because we're a victim of it day in and day out, but what's more important is what to do about it. And so while there are many problems uh, on police departments across the nation, and there's 18,000 of them, so I'm not um, believing that I'm going to change any of that in my lifetime. But I wanted to share with you who read my book ways in which I think might be helpful to ensure that you survive a police encounter, things that you can do to hopefully make sure that you're able to walk away from that police encounter because at the end of the day, my goal is to make sure that everybody goes home safe, the police and the community. And so that's the kind of information that you'll find in my autobiography, much like what I'm doing here with you today and what I do weekly on my own YouTube channel, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks. Okay, now thank you for that information. Uh, and I would be checking that book out. And um, I would check out the um, the first chapter, and then I I'm liking it, which just sound pretty interesting already. I'd be <laughs> probably a book that everybody should purchase, mainly a person of color, uh, since it does dealing with um, uh, people experience with the police officers. 
Uh, I'm damn curious. Uh, does you talk about like you know that some things that you can't prevent? You know, far as as, as you see, you know, people getting shot for no reason. Um, do you, you tell about how about going a, a way of solving that problem in your book, uh, dealing with that problem, those issues? Well, I talk a little bit about what I think are red flags sometimes that that I see certainly as a police supervisor. Uh, when I look at video recordings of officers and their interactions. And I think if the community had an idea about how to identify those red flags, in other words, an errant officer who um, is about to um, put you into the system either um, because you've pissed them off um, or because um, you're failing to comply. That's a thing that we hear all the time. The person didn't comply. And so therefore, you know, we get to choke them to death. And we know that not to be true. So I think that there are a lot of red flags. And I'll give you a real quick example. In the instance of Sandra Bland, when we saw the officer, um, Brian Insinia, who had written her a ticket and returned to the car and was about to present it to her for signature. And then he asked her, he said, you seem a little upset. And of course she was. And she said, yes, I am. And then she went on to explain why she was upset. And as soon as she explained, because you stopped me after I pulled over to let you go by, and this is BS, the officer, you can see his demeanor changes and his tone in the way that he speaks to her changes. Those are red flags. And then he says, put your cigarette out. And for me, that was the biggest red flag of all because I realized when he said, put that cigarette out, it's because he was going to put hands on her. He had already made up his mind that he was going to put hands on her and he didn't want her to have a lighted object. So I talk about mostly just complying. You may not recognize all the red flags and every situation is different, but most importantly, the one thing that you can do that might hopefully keep you, sh keep you safe is just to comply. Do what the officer says do. There's a process in place if you wanna file a complaint and I urge everybody to do that, create a paper trail so that there's a record that there's an errant officer on this police department profiling people, harassing people, uh, without justification, putting you into the system by way of an arrest for interfering or resisting, right? Because that's what they like to do. So I want people to know that to best survive that encounter, you need to first comply and then complain. Okay, and I'm talking about uh, like, you know, like incidents where people do comply and they still get something done that's the one i was kind of curious about so there's guess. no guarantee right there's no guarantee right and i can't i can't give you one but what i can promise you is when you don't you're more likely than not to wind up being the victim of what i trademarked contempt of cop you piss an officer off and there's a price to pay. We saw that with Eric Garner. They told him to turn around and submit to being handcuffed, and he didn't. And so they punished him. We saw that in the case of Mike Brown when Darren Wilson tried to get him to get out of the middle of the street because he accused him of jaywalking. And I guess Mike Brown didn't get out of the street soon enough, and the officer punished him. I mean, I could go on and on. Sam DeBose, who was stopped because he didn't have a front license plate, and the officer wanted to issue him a citation. And Sam DeBose tried to drive away, and the officer wound up shooting into the car and killing him. Walter Scott, who was stopped because he had a third tail light that didn't work. And when he got out of the car, he ran, and Michael Schlager chased him down like a dog, shot him in the back eight times, killing him. So we see what happens when we don't comply. And my best advice is to comply. Let the officer do whatever it is that they're gonna do and then file a complaint later. Now, listen, I'm not saying that when you file a complaint, you're gonna get the resolution that you want. My goal is to get you to survive. I want you to live through that police encounter. Cheryl, let me tell you something. That's why I like, it. That's why I like in this interview, you give so much information. I am, I'm actually enjoying what you're saying. You are very thorough uh, about what you're saying. Um, you're giving a uh, man, uh, a lot of gems here in 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 the short period of time, and I'm enjoying this interview so far. And I'm gonna tell you, that I'm really liking your answers, and uh, you get clear, clean uh, explanation and and examples, and it just it just very very good. Um, 
And um, I do have a question since you have said that, uh, as you know, why do you think, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, in your opinion, um, people of, of, of how you say color, black folks, or where you, how you want people want to use the terms, um, do in your opinion, do you think there is a big difference in how we're getting treated or you think um, it just what's getting reported? And if well, it is, Okay. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's a big difference. I mean, we know that, you know, there's a, a, a justice system for uh, those who are advantaged versus those who are disadvantaged. Sometimes it has to do with race. Other times it just has to do with where you are in terms of your so socioeconomic position, right? We know that I, I talk about this all the time on the LAPD. I say there are two police departments in Los Angeles. One north of the Santa Monica Freeway, which are where the more affluent areas are. And then there's an LAPD south of the Santa Monica Freeway, which is, you know, the hood, if you will. And so I'm sure that that's not unique to LAPD. I'm sure that there are police officers all around the country, and there's 18,000 police departments where officers act one way uh, when they're around us, and then completely different. We know this to be true. We see officers who get scared uh, by the mere presence of a black man of significant stature, and then they kill him, right? And then we see, conversely, what look like, you know, Second Amendment writers, uh, neo-Nazis, confront police who are armed, and the police do everything but lay them down on their back and rub them on their belly. So we know that there are two different ways in which officers conduct themselves, and that's why it's so important for us to be mindful to be um, careful and to use their system against them and not play into their hands. I think a lot of times, you know, officers try to provoke you. I've personally seen shared on social media videos where officer might stop um, a young black man, for instance, who did everything that the officer asked him to do, provided his information, had a license to drive and all of that. And then the officer started asking him, you know, have you used any marijuana? Do you have any in your car? You know, are you sure? And the guy's like, no, I don't. I don't have any weed. I don't smoke weed. And then the officer continues to ask him the same ridiculous question over and over and then tells him to get out of the car. I felt like the officer was trying to provoke this young man. And I'm so glad that he didn't play into the officer's hand. He let the officer go through his machinations and did everything that he um, wanted to do to him. And my hope is that ultimately, because I say this all the time, is, you know, get you a good ass attorney, <laughs> get you a good ass attorney and get paid. Yes, I've seen a video on your page and I actually liked that video. I think I shared as well. I was very um, happy and impressed how smart he was and he saw right through it. And he did, I mean, he did, um, he did a, a, a brilliant job. He didn't talk attitude or nothing. <laughs> I was thinking right. about it. he didn't even have an attitude about it. he could have got mad and offensive but he know um uh, you know that, that uh, I'm glad it turned out uh very well he got home safe you know and I'm, I'm glad the officer didn't plant anything like some of them will do but um uh, but yeah he tried to and it was crazy yeah I saw it I shared it and um that's probably one of the best videos I've seen where someone who handled it the right way and was very intelligent about how he did besides getting attitude and stuff. Cause I know when I was in the criminal, uh, taking a criminal justice, I know that, and it's kind of strange that uh, once a person get out of hand, <clears throat> even if the police are wrong, if they wrong the police somehow, some strange reason, they all make a throw what the police did out. They overlook it. You know, if you like, so even if the police are in the wrong and you uh, resist or something, a lot of times, uh, and I, and a uh, former police officer, he was of 17 years of uh, when I was in uh, school. He said, "Man, that's the thing. The thing about his life, you, if even if a police in the wrong, you know, uh, comply, or of course, if you don't comply, um, like the same thing can't be used against. They would throw uh, your side out of the story and protect that police, you know, if he's in the wrong." And, but, that's, and that's why it's so important, you know, I tell people all the time to create a paper trail, to file a complaint. And listen, I'm not uh, delusional and think that because you contact internal affairs that something is going to really get done. But the point of the matter is, is that you create a paper trail. Because if this officer mm -hmm. is misbehaving and violating policy, they're going to continue to do that. And at some point, someone along the uh, chain of command is gonna have to make a decision about whether or not this officer is a liability. Converse that with 
what we typically do in our community is the police stop us, they harass us, we get mad, we go home, we fuss, and then we don't make a record of it. We don't tell anybody except our friends and family. And so then when the officer gets involved in a situation where it becomes national news now because they've taken a life, it's very easy for that agency to say, well, we didn't know that this guy was heavy handed. We didn't know that he had um, anger management issues. Nobody ever complained. And that's why it's so important to create a paper trail. And when you do that, you need to do it in writing and you need to send a letter to the police chief, to an independent civilian review board, if your city has one, send it to the mayor, CC everyone that you are sending that complaint to so that everyone can see they're not the only one that got that letter. One person may be able to look away, but if you send it to six or seven people, six or seven people are not going to be able to round file your complaint. And it's very important that you do that. And I have a, uh, a question to ask you. Is there's a way that, um, <clears throat> cause it sounds like the system is not really made for us to win at all. And that's going to put it clear. And I don't think, I think protesting don't do a whole lot in my opinion. Um, I think sometimes outrage is, is okay. But what do you really think is it, if it is possible for, um, the system to have a more fair change. Do you think it's possible or um, at all, or you think it's a long way ahead or, you know, what, what, what can people do? Well, not in my lifetime and I'm just being real, but there are things that we can do and, and we just have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and get busy. We have to be willing to do some things that maybe make us uncomfortable. Part of what I think is important is I think people who look like me and you, should get on these police departments. And if you look around, if you read the FBI report that says that police departments are recruiting members of the KKK, right? So if you understand that to be true, some would say, well, why do I wanna be a police officer? Well, you wanna be a police officer because they're getting on the job. You wanna be a police officer because it wouldn't have been nice to have somebody who looks like you and I working with that officer that went to a Tatiana Jefferson's home when that officer pulled out his weapon, if I was working with him, I would have told him to put his damn gun up. What are you doing? You can't affect change from the outside. It's going to come from the inside and you need to be on those police departments. So when you see a partner who's doing something that you know is inappropriate, when you know that they're about to racially profile somebody, you can interject and intercede. You can't do that if you're, on the, if you're not on the department. And so listen, I know that it's difficult and they put roadblocks and obstacles in our way. You know, when we go in to be interviewed, they want to know how many bubbles are in a bar of soap. They don't ask that of our white counterparts. But nonetheless, knowing all of that, we need to be prepared. And so I'm encouraging young people, you know, I'm encouraging families to talk to your young people when, before they get involved in things that could be a disqualifier, become a police officer. Get on the department. You need to vote. You need to vote for mayors and sheriffs because those are elected officials, district attorneys. Those are the ones that help usher us into the system. You need to attend community meetings and talk when you have an opportunity to ask a police chief about his position on use of force and deadly use of force and when is it reasonable and why did you do this thing? And so these are the kinds of things that I say again every week on my YouTube channel, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks to educate people about the kinds of questions that you should have when you're asking a police chief about a deadly encounter. I give you the words because I understand the lingo and I help you interpret what a police chief might say that might sound reasonable, but if you just take a step back and think about it, you know that it's not, and so you wanna follow up with, well, chief, what about this? And why did that happen? And I know you said that the officer thought he had a gun or she had a gun, but why did the officer think that? Can you explain it to me? And are you having your officers articulate why they thought they needed to shoot six times someone who was unarmed? Those are the kinds of things that we need to know so that we can put ourselves in a better position to then challenge those false narratives when we hear them. Yes, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dawson, for that uh, info. And like I said, and right in the middle of this interview, I want to let people know right now, uh, based on what she's saying, all the things she's given me, uh, I've told, and if you're listening to this uh, interview, 
uh, most definitely it's uh, Black and Blue. It's a book to sound like we all need to purchase, mainly people of color. Um, Cause I believe, and based on what you're saying, I'm sure there's a lot of information in the book. It would educate us on how to, um, to do things and handle procedures. And also to share uh, what our youth as well is coming up. So um, look at just like a, a, a spiritual direction of, of having more weapons of uh, what to do of with type of injustice in the, in the in society in the police department. So, you know, Ms. Cheryl, don't say, oh, with, with, with all this information said, um, your book is looking like gold right now to me because I'm serious. I'm not, not saying because I'm, I think anybody who watches the interview and I will share and I will push the link you shared on your YouTube or, uh, or your website because this is a very powerful interview and I've heard you talk on many news stations as well. But uh, you wouldn't, you would, you know, you got bits of gold here and pieces of this and interviews. But what I like about this interview is gonna be a little bit different because people will get more, inf- more of you. And like most interviews, it's on a short amount of time that you have time to speak to give that information. On this interview, I did this interview because I like um, you to elaborate and give a lot of information, well around information, and a longer, uh, uh, better platform. And you have doing that so far. And I'm not even just got um, finished yet. That's some more question I'm going to ask you because I want to to um, be able to dissect some things, and I know you can dissect almost anything when it comes to this. Like you said about the cigarette, the cigarette thing. Now I'm saying this, I didn't see that. I mean, you from a police and 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 uh, I, you understood. Uh, uh, like you said about the cigarette, he told him to put the cigarette out. That I they didn't cross my mind of what he was thinking because you know a lot of times they say, well you don't know what the officer thinking, but not that be stupid. You can't tell what a person think about, you know, if, you, if, if when you're doing certain situations through experience, you do know what people are thinking, where if they say it or not, that's not be stupid. But they always say, you don't know what the officer thinking. They always say there's a, a cover up too. But when you point at that fact out about the cigarette, um, I can see it the way you say it, but all these years I've seen the video. It, that never crossed my mind that he was answering to put it out because he was about to do so. I thought, he was doing it just to, just to, uh, and my, my, I thought he was just doing it just to, to show authority, like, you know, like. To be you provocative. Make, yeah. Right. Like, and that's, I'm gonna make that's you do kind it. of what I think Sandra thought, because she's like, I'm sitting in my own car, I'm smoking a cigarette. What are you talking about? But I understood, because see, here's the thing. I've worked patrol my entire 20 years. And so I understand patrol and police officers' state of mind. I understand police culture. I understand police code talk when I hear it. And so that's why I come regularly to share things that are happening real time right now, trending and point out, okay, so here's here's what happened in the Tatiana Jefferson situation. We talked about an officer, you know, walking around the house and shining a light into the window and how it's unreasonable for him to say that somehow he perceived a threat. She's inside, you're outside. Tactically, what he should have done was just retreat if he was really afraid, right? Just go to your car, get in it, lock your door and call for help, right? He's outside. There was no reason for him to shoot through that window. And and listen, Fort Worth understands that. That's why they um, are trying now to appease this family. And at the end of the day, they're going to do with this family what they do with every other family. They're going to throw buckets of money at the family. And unless that community is really engaged and involved, little will be done to change the policy and procedure in terms of how those officers comport themselves over there in Fort Worth. So it's important to recognize and understand that I'll share another little thing with you that I see happen all the time and people don't understand. When you see an officer put on black leather gloves, they're about to fight you. They're about to fight you. And there are instances, if you look at videos, when you see officers starting to don gloves, and right after that, the next thing that happens is is they put hands on people. There was an incident here in California a few years ago. There was a 55, 56-year-old grandmother on the freeway who was savagely beaten by a CHP officer because she was homeless and the officer said he was trying to get her off the freeway for her safety. Her name was Marlene Pinnock. In the video, you see the officer put on black leather gloves and the next thing you see him do is straddle her 
on the side of the freeway and then just beat her MMA style. When officers pull out leather gloves, that's a red flag. They're about to put hands on you. Man, see, that's why I like this interview. Yeah, you've dropped us, man, so much jewels. Ms. Dorsey, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Um, the way you're doing things, I know you ain't dumb. And I know when you put out certain information, I think um, it's, 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 it's good information, but it also is kind of scary because I know when people speak this type of truth, you already know that there's a system where people might try to, I, I pray nobody try to do anything to you because you are dropping um, information that could change many people's lives, that could change the... Uh, the way people see America Day. It's not just opening black people. Like you open the uh, white people's eyes as well. Us and white people, like you said, they live in a different world. They don't understand what goes on, but um, uh, truly don't understand the truth of what's going on because they live in a separate world. But uh, the way you put out information, there are some white people who has uh, waking up and have seen uh, for what people talk about, do the video cameras and everything. A lot of times people used to take the word of police and they say, oh, well, they just saying it because they just saying, you know, a long time ago, I used to say, well, people, black people just saying that just because they looking for alibi and stuff like that, about racism and stuff like that. But now that people seeing it and uh, you able to give this information, you open up many people's eyes of, of all uh, nationality, what goes on in this country. And then we know what goes on in this country, but for to have you, someone like yourself, who be in the system, to come around and tell the system where it's wrong, you know that that um I know I know you probably got a lot of hate stuff already in the past. You probably used to it. And I know you ain't no food too, but I'm glad to have people who are bold as you to come out and say the things and speak your mind clearly the way you are. Um <clears throat> Well, you know, when I first started doing this back in 2013, when I wrote my book, I already understood when I wrote the book that it was gonna be controversial and it was gonna be problematic. But you know, LAPD taught me well, and I'm not thin skinned. And I have said all along, I continue to say, and I have to remind people who come to my YouTube channel, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks, SGT Dorsey Speaks, that um, what I say is not really, I'm not looking for your agreement because I'm just telling you what I know. Now, if I say something and it resonates with you, because really what I'm trying to do is educate you and help you, that's all great and good. But if you don't agree with me, it works for me, right? So I say what I say, I'm, I'm not thin skinned, I'm not bothered by people's opinion, no matter the ethnicity of the person that disagrees with me, because listen, I got a lot of people that look like me that don't always agree with what I say as well. But I do it because I realize that I'm in such a unique position having been on a major metropolitan police department like the Los Angeles Police Department. Having worked in patrol for 20 years, I would, I would say to you, and I think I can say this clearly, that there is not another female black or white, who has the kind of experience that I have in patrol, worked on the LAPD in 1980 to 2000. The things that I experienced here in Los Angeles, the proliferation of gangs and gang violence and all of the things that went on under the command of Daryl Francis Gates, that time has come and gone. You know, the things that I experienced on the LAPD you can't experience that anymore. You can't experience um, the battering ram and O.J. Simpson trial and the rots, uh, the L.A. riots. All of those things have come and gone. And I was working in patrol. So I can tell you unequivocally working South Bureau Crash, the gang unit uh, in, the, in the 80s, that um, I chased people through the houses. I've had suspects run from me, violent suspects. I've had to fight suspects. And in my 20 years, guess what? I never shot anybody. So I know that you could take a violent suspect into custody, somebody who's not compliant, somebody who's giving you a lot of lip. You can take them into custody, eventually put them in jail, allow them to have their dignity along the way, and everybody lives. Thank you. I believe that too. Um, I had, uh, like I said, when I was in uh, high school, like I had this former police officer told a uh, criminal justice he would tell my ways you can uh get a person down without beating them up and slamming across here with a gun he said that was here to uh martial arts and i think they do teach police that but i didn't see no police using the skill because that's the way you can grab somebody's hand and take them down 
without and they'll drop everything or uh, he said those techniques you can get people down without having to hurt them severely um and, and he he demonstrated some of it too and it was amazing he said yeah police a lot of police officers don't have to do a lot of things they do to get a person down harass them pick them on body slam so you don't got to do all that uh simple techniques that you can do to get a person down and he hasn't complied without uh abusing them and because you know i think a lot of times what we see is and that's why i, I trademark the term that i use when i speak contempt of cop because officers get particularly male officers they get personally invested and when somebody they think is not complying now they want to punish you it has very little to do uses of force generally have very little to do with trying to gain compliance trying to take someone into custody it's really more about punishing you because you didn't do what i said and that is not what police officers are taught. And I think being a female probably puts me in a particular situation because listen, at the end of the day, I know there's not a guy out there who I could beat up for real, for real. So I've got to use other techniques in which to gain compliance. Sometimes it's just something as simple as having a conversation with you, telling you why it is that I stopped you. People just wanna know. People wanna be treated with dignity. If I pull somebody over and I don't look at that person and think, wow, he could be one of my four sons, because I have four. If I don't look at that person and think, he could be my son, let me, let me deal with him accordingly. Or if I pull over a car with a baby in the back seat, like Philando Castile had, and I don't look in that back seat and see that little girl, as maybe that could be my little sister or my little cousin, right? That officer didn't look at that little girl in the back seat, and she, that's why he had no problem firing seven rounds into Philando Castile, one of which could have hit that baby. So if you're not able to relate to people, if you don't see them um, as something other than an object, it's very, very easy for you to treat them that way. And listen, a lot of it is common sense. And I say, if sense were common, everybody would have it. It's not something you can teach. And so to that end, I think police departments, and this is a conversation that your listeners can have with police chiefs, when they talk to them is, what kind of a background check are you doing? What kind of psychological evaluations are you providing for your uh, recruit candidates and your officers once they're on the job? Because listen, as a police officer in patrol, we see stuff day in and day out. We work with partners regularly who might sway the way you think and view things. And I think it would be helpful it should be mandatory that a police officer is reevaluated psychologically, I'll just say every two years to make sure that their head is on right. And if you find that there's someone out there operating with implicit bias or who um, has a propensity to racially profile, you need to pull them aside and have a fireside chat. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for that information. Man, that's so much information. It's just amazing how you give information. I just be soaking it up. Um, now I have a question. We're going to get into some uh, situations. We go again to the uh, Botham Jean and the uh, uh, Tatiana Jefferson case. There are similar cases, and I do think there are similar cases. We also think there's in the uh, the outcome or the uh, the way the family handled it. We know the way we handle the business is totally different. But we're going to talk about the Botham Jean case. Um, First, um, you know, cause both of them are very similar. Uh, people, people getting shot and they, you know, murdered. I'm gonna say shot but murdered in their own homes, in their own uh, comfort home should be a place of rest and peace. Um, I understand that uh, conversation. Uh, we would like to elaborate on the Botha Jean case because I want to also uh, talk about how the the family handled the situation, his brother handled the situation. Of, of the mindset of his brother. We want to talk about the situation. They want to talk about the mindset of uh, Botha Jean's brother of, you know, he got a lot of backlash and I can understand why, if you don't mind. So uh, in terms of Botha Jean, what I believe, I have a theory. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just my theory based on, you know, who I am and police culture and all of that. Um, I don't believe for a minute Amber Geiger went there um, by accident. I don't think she mistook his residence for hers. I've talked extensively about this on my YouTube channel as well as on some network channels where I have been discussing the trial 
and the aftermath of the trial. And I'll just tell you very briefly, if, if your listeners want to know more, I'm going to direct them to my YouTube channel to um, look at some of the videos that I have up where I've talked extensively about that. But I do believe that Amber Geiger um, went there intentionally. She parked on the fourth floor. I believe that her boyfriend slash lover slash partner, Martin Rivera, uh, knew exactly what she was going there to do because police officers talk. You're in the car for eight hours a day. You have conversations about stuff. And I think that night she had told him that she was going to go over there. I believe she was working security for that complex. They won't admit that because of the liability. You understand why. Um, I believe that earlier in the day, it was reported Botham John had been contacted by the leasing office. Someone said they smell marijuana coming out of his apartment. So I think the leasing office called Amber Geiger while she was at work and said, hey, when you get off tonight, could you go and uh, talk to the person in 1478? And I think that's what she went there to do. I think her partner knew she was going to go there to do that. She admitted that at her previous complex where she worked, she worked as uh, a courtesy officer, which means you live there, but you agree to resolve conflict on the property for a discounted rate. I think that's what she was doing at Southside Flats. So when she went over there and she confronted him, and again, my theory, I think she had a pass key. I think she used her pass key, which we've seen, again, on my website, uh, I mean, on my YouTube channel. You see the key in the door, and she used the pass key to open it up we don't know what happened after that because Botham is not here. He can't tell us that she opened up his door, said something to him. He questioned her as he's seeing her come through the door and then she shoots and kills him. What we do know from the court trial that was um, aired is that after she shot him, she sent a text message to her boyfriend partner, Martin Rivera, and she said, I fucked up, hurry, come here. She didn't say where he needed to come. She didn't say how she fucked up. She didn't say any detail because I believe Martin Rivera knew already where she was, what she was going to do, and had an idea about what could have gone wrong. That's my theory. Having said all that, fast forward to the trial. She convicted herself in that trial when she did the demonstration on the behest of her attorney where she talked about taking a one-arm stance, understanding that firing two rounds in rapid succession, which is what police officers are taught to do, trained to do, that's how we practice, firing two rounds in rapid succession at the tin ring, which is where your heart is, she testified under oath that doing that would kill him, and therefore it was her intent to kill him. And so that's why the jury took five minutes to convict her. Now, everything that happened after that in terms of the judge giving her a Bible, the bailiff stroking her hair, you know, the brother wanting to hug her. My thing is, look, family, if you want to forgive somebody, I understand you need to have peace um, so that you're in a good space. But do that at the house. <laughs> do that quietly in your prayer closet. Don't be getting on TV and saying that, you know, I really didn't want her to get any kind of penalty because now we see she got a slap on the hand. And you do understand that she's appealing the slap on the hand. So she may wind up getting little or no time at all. It's very problematic for me. Yeah, me too. Why don't, I'm trying to figure why the brother would say something like that. I mean, if I am mistaken, did she have some type of test message that was you know that she didn't you know care much for black people those she worked with but i'm trying to figure why would a man say you want to be somebody's friend why you make that statement that's what i don't understand well you know i can't prejudge the young man but what i think my personal belief is that <clears throat> i think because they are a different culture right they're from saint lucia and so i mean i i get it they look like us you know we would say that they're black but really are they um, I think maybe that they are not really aware like we are about the, the kinds of confrontations and the outcomes that happen here uh, in the U.S. day in and day out. And so maybe, you know, their thought process is a little different. And then I've read and heard, um, you know, and I don't know this to be true that, you know, and you would understand that he's had some problems dealing with the loss of his brother and he may himself have some issues that um, caused him to act in a way that might be a little bit different from how you and I might act. Not to say that it's right or wrong, because at the end of the day, you know, he needs to be able to find some peace 
so that he can function. And if that's what he needed to do in that moment, I don't um, begrudge that young man that I just wished it hadn't been done in such a public way. Yes, I agree. I, I, I accept what you just said as too. Uh, I was just curious, uh, you know, that, 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 that's a pretty, um, you know, reasonable thought. And uh, I'll accept that as well. Cause I don't know either. I was just curious. I thought it was strange, but on um, best information, yeah, I kind of understand um, when it comes to cultures, the people handle things a little different based on the upbringing as well. Well, if we agree to it, it's not as being as living this country for a long period of time as black people. Um, now, what about uh, the Atatia Jefferson case? This is a very interesting case, and I kind of like this one, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But uh, in that situation, uh, I know you already touched on it all, already, but um, uh, how, what, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think the end result will be into this, this situation? Well, the officer has already been given what I call the gift of resignation. So he was able to resign before he was fired. And I know a lot of people are really bothered by that, but there is a process. You know, police officers do have something called um, the Bill of Rights. Uh, there's due process that we are afforded. And so you can't just fire somebody without going through the steps. Because when that happens, and you may have bear witness to this, officers are fired, and then you see later they get their job back, they're reinstated because the agency didn't follow proper procedure and protocol in pursuit of a termination. So this officer, Dean, was able to hurry up and submit resignation papers before he was able to be fired, so that's a done deal. Now that's not to say if he um, evades prison that he can't go get a job somewhere else, right? We don't know, that remains to be seen, but what I believe will happen at the end of the day is that um, this city, Fort Worth, is going to pay this family and they will pay them well and um, that'll be that. And then, you know, some other officer on that agency will live to offend again because listen, I see all sorts of stuff. I'm not there in Fort Worth or Dallas, but I see stuff almost on a weekly basis occurring uh, in Texas with police officers and I'm not seeing them do much by way of trying to deter the bad behavior. If an officer doesn't have to pay financially, if he's not coming out of his own pocket for a civil suit, and he's not because it's taxpayer money, if the officer isn't disciplined in some kind of way or if he's given the gift of resignation so he could go get a job on another department like Betty Shelby or Darren Wilson or Timothy Lohman who shot and killed Tamir Rice, if an officer is able to do that, then what effectively has that agency done to deter that officer from shooting and killing another black man or woman if they get scared, if they perceive a threat? Nothing. All right. I think I don't know if you heard of a guy named um, um, Lee Merritt, but I know he had put up a GoFundMe for uh, the Tatiana uh, Jefferson uh, situation. He has um, said he had mentioned a little bit about what you said. So he put that up for for the family as well. So he said that in many cases he wrote on Facebook that um, he didn't want them to have to settle out in order to you know take hush money basically. And uh, it's two fifty plus on the GoFundMe, as I seen, and um, I like the idea what he said and what he done to um, to do that. And I'm hoping they don't take a payoff, because that's the purpose of the GoFundMe, so they won't feel the need or pressure to uh, accept the payment of hush money. Basically, what it is, uh, a gag order, basically what I call it. And um, I don't know, uh, do you know anything about Lee Merritt? Uh, I've kept up with what he been doing? Have you ever met him? Yeah, we, Lee and I have had conversations in the past about cases that he's been involved in uh, when he's wanted to um, ask my question about the viability of a suit. And listen, um, we're not gonna have no black on black crime here, but let me just say this. Lee Merritt is a, a civil rights attorney and you know his job is to take people to money court. Let's be clear, that's what he does. And so I'm not begrudging him, you know, uh, this family will make money. Uh, he will get a percentage of that money because he's entitled to it as their lawyer. And absolutely, um, <laughs> Lee Merritt is suing Fort Worth when the time comes. Now, he hasn't announced that just yet, 
what he said factually on social media, Facebook specifically with regards to the GoFundMe was so that it would help deter any expenses that the family might have in however many months or years it takes to get to the end of a civil suit because these things can be very protracted and, and they take a long time and there may be expenses that a GoFundMe would help the family in the meantime. So, um, you know, that's his thing, that's what he does. And um, I know that there are people who uh, really believe in his efforts. And I know that there are many people who think he's an opportunist. So I'm gonna just leave that there. You know, I like how you say things. You can say things without saying things. And also, you also say thing where it could be up in the air for grabs and people leave their own perception. I like how you do that. I like how you put it out there. I like how you get information and let people come to your own conclusion. That's very political. That's very smart. But, you know, if you're smart, you can read between the lines. But basically, what I'm just hearing is that the money is just a cushion for them to survive until they get the big check. That's basically what I heard. But I'm not saying that you should say it. But you just saying that money is there <laughs> to to um to help them through their grief. Well, you know, I know that you know attorneys are expensive, and you know, as he's doing this thing that he's going to be doing to represent not only this family, but he's also representing both of John's family. And you know, it's listen. I get that, you know, maybe when you are involved in these kinds of cases, at some point you be, you develop a certain level of expertise, you know, but when you kind of see the same faces popping up every time there's a death, then, you know, some people wonder, are they really there for the family or are they there for themselves? And so, you know, I can't speak to Lee Merritt's heart um, certainly, I think any family who loses a loved one should absolutely uh, receive some sort of compensation. You cannot pay enough money to replace the loss of a loved one, be clear. But at the same time, what I would like to see attorneys like Lee Merritt and Ben Crump, who I know, who actually uh, was very gracious and wrote a, a review for me on uh, the back cover of my book, Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate, I appreciate him for that. What I would like to see them do is tie into the money that they're gonna get, because they're gonna get money, particularly in the case of a Tatiana, they're gonna get money. Tie in changes to the policy of that police department. Tie in changes to the tactics that officers use before they fire their weapon. Here in California, we had law just passed, Assembly Bill 392. AB 392 speaks to when a police officer can use deadly force. It used to be you could use deadly force when it was reasonable. Now it's when it's necessary. And an officer has to articulate what makes it necessary. It can't just be based on, I was in fear, I perceived a threat. It has to be based on Everything in it, the totality, not just the moment when you pull the weapon, but all of the tactics that lead up to the up to the deadly use of force. Because listen, a lot of times we see police officers create a situation to use deadly force by either antagonizing you, by trying to um, goat you into uh, doing something that maybe they can now say, oh, you're resisting, you didn't comply, so I had to put hands on you to get you in compliance, and as soon as I grab you, you jerk away, you jerk away, and now I think you're reaching for my weapon, voila, I perceived a threat. So wouldn't it be nice if when these attorneys get these million dollar settlements that they also require the police department to do something about training their officers and the tactics that the officers use before they use deadly force. Great idea. That's a very good idea. Maybe they ain't thought about it. Maybe they just don't know. Maybe they stuck on what their agenda is that they can't see. Or, or is it just that the system does what the system was designed to do? Yeah, it's kind of like a funeral home. You know, when people die, that you know, people don't really shop a whole lot with funeral home. You can have the same casket, one the same casket be two thousand dollars somewhere else, and 
somewhere else you pay five thousand dollars and they have more than one fear home down by the same people but since people are pain and suffering and and when you're pain and suffering you don't really think rational sometimes because you're too emotional to see things clearly people get taken advantage of well then there's that am i right because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a system that is it, it's funny how um the system make a lot of money off of people's fear, pain, and suffering. But even the medical field and, and, and from however, and, and no one really giving you a real answer, giving you a pacifier. And listen, doesn't one hand wash the other, right? I mean, police, and listen, there's some people that deserve to be in jail. I'm clear on that. I mean, not everybody that gets arrested uh, is involved in criminality. I certainly never arrested people who didn't commit a crime. So I know that there are people that are committing crimes and they need to go to jail. But there are also police officers out there that are arresting people who didn't commit a crime. And so you arrest these people who didn't commit a crime or you stop enough people and write enough tickets to create revenue for your city. Well, you've got your prisons are filled, right? And we need to keep them filled because we can't have them just sitting there empty, right? Money um, you know, goes along with that. Uh, prosecutors, you know, you got to have people to prosecute. So if police officers aren't arresting folks and, you know, we call it humming them in the jail, you know, that's kind of a LA term for just, you know, putting people in the system unnecessarily, then there would be no work for prosecutors. There would be no trials. I mean, so every, every entity seems to have a symbiotic relationship with another one and, and it's all beneficial, right? So, you know, it, Maybe, I'm not saying it, but I'm just thinking out loud, maybe that's why some of these police chiefs, commissioners, and sheriffs don't really have an appetite to fix the system. Because then if they really fixed it, are they out of work? I don't know. Good question. They probably would be out of work. They probably would have to trim the fat off the system because you're right. Um, a lot of jobs and opportunities are created off of uh, laziness and uh, uneducated people, and um, and it's easy to take advantage of when you're not educated in many factors. It really is. Um, you're probably right. They probably be out of a job because um, you you, have, you won't need many people to do the things uh, that you're paying for, because the problem is not as big of an issue as it is. So yes, I do understand that. Um, that is a fearful thing, but um, you know it's sad that we how we create jobs out of things of of, of such. And um, the thing about it would be nice to create jobs for uh, for real counseling and not pacifiers to help people. But there's a fear. I guess people has a fear that they won't be able to make the money survive without a villain or somebody who locked in jail to make prison off the system. Um, Another thing I want to ask you is about um, the term of slave patrol, the history. I know you heard it before. In my yes. opinion, you see a big difference in the slave patrol to the police force today, or you think it just got a different name? Well, listen, I wasn't around, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. I, I get that I look like this <laughs> and I've got all this gray hair. But um, listen, I, I think, you know, there's a, a, a need for police departments and I understand how it got started. But I think there's a need for police departments. I think there's a need for police officers. And I also believe um, that the majority of people who join police departments join for the right reason. Um, no matter the ethnicity. I worked with, um, you know, during my 20 year career, folks who look like me and folks who don't, that were really there trying to make a difference, trying to um, create a uh, quality living environment, if you will, for folks. But we also have to acknowledge that there are some bad apples and, you know, everybody who wants to be the police shouldn't necessarily be the police. And I don't think there's any harm or wrong in admitting that maybe a couple of people slipped through the cracks. And that's why I think it's important to shore up background investigations and to include recurring psychological evaluations to make sure that you have the best people on the department trying to serve a community in a way that um, is effective and um, 
trustworthy, if you will. And we don't seem to have that right now. And again, I believe that if police chiefs, commissioners, and sheriffs really had a vested interest in making things better, they could do the things that would speed that process up. For instance, if you, I have people ask me all the time, why don't the good officers tell on the bad officers? If there's so many of them out there and they outnumber the bad officers, well, part and parcel is because if you don't have the support of your police chief, if you don't have the backing of your supervisor, a lieutenant or a captain, why would you risk coming forward and speaking about something that's occurring when you know it could ultimately cost you your job, your ability to take care of your family. And it's no different if you're a police officer than if you work in a hospital or if you work in a school district and you're working with someone who's not following policy, are you gonna be the one that's running up to the office to tell the principal all the time when you know that the principal is not gonna support you? Of course not. So a police chief could create a safe environment, have real whistleblower protection. You probably hear a lot of that term right now because of what's going on um, in uh, the political realm with regards to whistleblowers and what happens to you when you tell about wrongdoing. Same thing is true for police departments. There is no safe place for a police officer to report misconduct and not find themselves later subjected to retaliation. It's a real thing. All right, thank you for that one. Uh, and I have another question uh, concerning the um, the uh, Boston Jean case. Um, that one question I was going to ask you, I was curious about a lot of people was talking about about the witness. Uh, um, Joshua Brown. Yeah, Joshua Brown being murdered. Um, what is your um, opinion on what really happened? So um, here's my position. Talked about this on my YouTube channel. Uh, I believe that, um, and I know there's a contingency of people that are um, convinced that he was assassinated is the term I'm hearing by um, Dallas Police Department because of his testimony. Um, I don't agree with that. That's not to say that Dallas Police Department may not have an officer or two on their department who's not capable of assassinating someone. But Amber Geiger was not convicted because of anything Joshua Brown said. He merely corroborated the fact that she was there, there was a shooting, he heard some things, and that was pretty much what he testified to. We now know that Joshua Brown was involved in some stuff that probably put him in harm's way. There's certainly plenty of video out there uh, on social media that he put up himself of him and being involved in either marijuana sales or, uh, you know, whatever. There's video of him doing all of that. So did he surround himself by some people that meant him harm? Maybe. We know that he was shot a year ago while he was out at a uh, strip club with some friends and one of his uh, buddies was killed in that shooting. He was shot in his foot and it was reported, according to um, the attorney that represents his family, Lee Merritt, that um, he left town. He was in California and he was here actually up until the day that he testified. He had just come back from the airport and went right to court to testify in the trial. The reason he was here in California allegedly is because he was concerned about the people that had shot him a year ago. People that he's reported to know because they were childhood friends and he had left town, the inference is, to get away from these people. He didn't want to testify at the trial because it was high profile and now these guys would know he's back in town. And then he comes back, he testifies, he's still involved in this whole marijuana situation, allegedly, and he gets killed. That's what I think. Now that you gave me that background information, I gotta stand where you come from. That's, that's why I say I, I bring you on here are you very you well rounded and stuff and you just don't speak stuff out of out of the feelings and emotion you have to do your research and that's why i brought you a lot of people don't do research and we'll just take people word for it and go with the news media and say oh you know and just jump the gun and uh you know unfortunately yeah you you're probably right and we're, we're if we want to hear it or not because everybody want to paint a villain and and people's hurt right now so it's easy to point finger and blame so it's not true it's not a, it's a lie because people are hurt and still bother about the 
the the you know the situation at hand. They want some type of justice, so uh, they're not gonna look at that or do the research. And I think it's important that uh, we do research, mainly black people, and um, I, that's why I, I come to you for you know for uh, for your side of the story and your take, and you give very uh, clear information and why you believe what you believe. Um, and you, you, you back it up. <laughs> you just don't be going off feels and emotions. You be uh, going rational, looking at the facts, looking at the truth, and looking at the unfortunate part that the fact he did get involved, uh, and um, which would have been kind of not smart on his part to do stuff like that right after a high profile case anyway. You would like to lay low or something, but not a smart decision. If that's well, you know, people are people are who they are. And if he was involved in that lifestyle, you know, that's that's how he supports himself. You know, that's how he gets down. And so I I had a lot of people come on my YouTube channel and say, you know, it's unreasonable to think somebody would drive from Louisiana to Texas to buy marijuana. Contrast that with I had people come on my YouTube channel and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm about that life. And not only will I drive three hours, I'll fly. <laughs> wow. So, you know. I'm hearing both sides. I don't indulge. You know, uh, I know, you know, I might drive three, four hours to get a pair of shoes, <laughs> whereas somebody may not. So it just all depends on what's important to you. But it just seems reasonable for me, given that I know he did not convict Amber Geiger. That I'm clear on. There are three people now who are in custody for his death. And, you know, I'm not into conspiracy theories. It would take a whole lot of people um, to cover up a whole lot of stuff. I even had someone come to my channel and say that they thought a Tatiana Jefferson's funeral or her death was um, staged by crisis actors. You know, they, they equated that to the whole Sandy Hook thing. Someone said, well, how come they haven't had her funeral? That was last week because, you know, the funeral was delayed. And they were like, well, how come they haven't had the funeral? You know, remember Sandy Hook? And I'm like, sir, get off, get off my page with that foolishness. They haven't had the funeral because, you know, there's some um, conflict right now between the family. And so the funeral is going to be had. But imagine how many people would have to be caught up in that conspiracy to put forth uh, that a Tatiana Jefferson was killed and she wasn't even a real person. I mean, it's just, it's ludicrous and it's insulting, but those are the kinds of things that people believe and you can't change their mind. And I don't try. Yeah, really. Especially when, you know, people be on, be on a page that know her personally, be writing a lot of stories about how they met them and how she what type of person she was. <laughs> so, you know, they stay, it was stay somebody would have came out. Some close friend or relative would have came out and said something who they were, and, and nobody's stupid. But people are very stupid. That's one thing I wanted to uh, bring up the fact. Um, this is, listen, ma'am, um, why, in your, in my opinion, do you think black people are not taken seriously? Now, in my opinion, is I think they're not educated enough to do the right thing. And I hate to say that because it's point at the time we have to take responsibility. People is not going to uh, see, don't see you as inferior because maybe they couldn't know how you're going to react and what you is and ain't going to do. And in my opinion, I want you, in your opinion, that's what I believe. I want you to elaborate. Like, why come, why, why come black people not taking them seriously? And do black people take themselves seriously when it comes to uh, situations such as these? You know, what, 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 what can we do? Because it had to be some education going. That's what I like about your book. You, you know, I read the first few part of your book. It's very educational, what you're telling us. Uh, it's very educational. I think we need some education. But we like to explain explain and break down why come all these years that uh, what black people need to do to 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 be taken more seriously. Well, I think we need to learn from the histories of the, the, the past, right? We need lessons of the past. And, and we need to be very mindful and very considerate about the kinds of things that we put forth. And that's what I try to do um, when I speak. I try to speak credibly. Um, I know that I speak credibly. I speak based on, you know, what I know. And um, when you don't take the time to do your research and your homework, when you just put forth something that you don't know if it's true. And listen, you know, it's very easy to be sheeple, right? We see it on social media all the time. Someone puts up a link. 
I don't know how many times you've seen this. I've certainly seen, you know, someone put up a link of uh, rest in peace for Lena Horne as if she just died. <laughs> and then someone comes behind and says, well, you know, she died 10 years ago. That link is old. But we see it and then we just start to spread it and share it and pass it and talk about it as if it's a real thing or as if it's a current thing. And so at some point, you know, you do that so many th times, I think people, you know, believe you're like, you know, the boy who cried wolf. And so when you finally do have a situation that really merits attention and, um, and um, should be believed and there should be a process to make sure that doesn't happen again, it's very easy to just minimize and dismiss and mitigate what we're saying particularly when you contrast that with someone who actually knows what they're talking about, which is kind of why I started speaking out for these families because I was seeing families like Mike Brown and Ezell Ford and um, Tamir Rice and John Crawford and everybody else that happened in 2014. And I would see news reporters ask them, well, what do you want to say to the police chief? What do you want them to know? What do you want them to do? And families who've just lost a loved one, all they know is I'm hurting. I, I don't know what I want. I don't, I don't even understand why the police did that thing that they did. And so that's why I come forward and I speak to give you the words if you hear me and if you find value in what I say, I give you the words so that you will be able to ask follow-up questions, to question what it is you're being told and not just take it blanket as gospel as truth because it was from someone who's supposed authority figure right someone who's worn the uniform and i can tell you something that you don't know because you never wore the uniform well i can tell you something that you don't know because i did wear the uniform and so once i share it with you hopefully you'll share it with somebody else and then that will become a replicating story that will get passed around. And then at some point, people can no longer not listen to what it is that we're saying. Much like what's happening with video, right? Because before the advent of cell phones and people recording abuses, when we said we were assaulted by the police and we were arrested unfairly and unjustly, no one believed it. Now they can't deny it, it's on video, but they try to explain it away by saying, oh yeah, I saw that the officers shot your loved one, you know, six times in the grandmother's backyard. But, you know, what you didn't know is that the officer thought that cell phone was a gun. And so therefore, I'm talking about Stefan Clark here in Fresno, California, or Sacramento. Um, somehow that was okay. But if you don't have the words to combat what that authority figure says, then that authority figure's version, that police officer's version, is taken as truth because great deference is given to what a police officer says. So when I speak the way that I do, while people may not agree with what I say and they may not like what I say, what they can never credibly do is say, I'm not telling the truth. Yes, thank you for that. Wow, that's, that's, that's some good information. As always, yeah, I, I interviewed uh, Stefan's brother, um, before I put on my, he's on my YouTube channel. I didn't talk to him about the incident because um, I figured, you know, okay, he was going through some uh, mental issues dealing with his brother because that was the second brother he lost to a uh, uh, murder. So uh, I didn't talk to him about that, but he was doing some things for the community, which he was uh, sincerely about that I questioned and asked him about on the interview. He don't do too many interviews. I did one with him and it's on my YouTube channel and um, as well. Um, the next I want to talk to you about is um, the um, cupcake, Camilla, like Camille uh, McKinney. Um, that situation was a very unfortunate situation. Um, it's a little different situation, though, but um, I think that's a situation I think could have been so much prevented. Um, what do you uh, have to say about? that situation can you uh give me your uh elaborate on what you think about that particular situation on cupcake situation the girl that found dead yeah the three-year-old that was found uh, in a dumpster in um birmingham alabama i believe and so listen as parents you know family we need to be very careful uh we need to protect our children we need to be mindful ladies about who we have around our children 
We need to make sure that we monitor them at all times. It's reported that she was at a, a family event, a birthday party. It was 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. I'm just wondering, how does a three-year-old at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night get out of view? She was playing with another little three-year-old from the video that was shown. So there were two little toddlers kind of on their own playing. It's dark. And someone was able to come up and either lure them or the little girl followed because she felt comfortable with the person. Now they're saying that there's no known connection. And for me, that's, that sounds like some code talk right there. The police chief said there's no known connection. Now that's not to say that we may not find out later that maybe uh, these people that are in custody for her death might know this little girl or may have seen her in the area or may have, you know, chatted with her. She's been playing in this uh, community center, right? Where the little girl felt comfortable following the person. I don't know. But at the end of the day, as a parent myself, a three-year-old far enough away where I can't reach out with my hand and touch them is problematic as a parent. So we have to do better. Most definitely, because this as we had a party, there's a lot of people around, and normally, normally you you know at a party, you know, everybody knows somebody, and you just can't. Even if it's nighttime, you'll say, "Well, my kids, they were three years old," and and that that is that's not good for <laughs> black people, especially this day and time. They had the kids at anywhere, especially all the bad things going on with black people. Um, it's not smart, and especially three year old. That is that's not good at all. Um, it, I, 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 that was more, that's kind of disturbing in itself. Worse, you know, I, I guess I'd say probably a bit worse because, and then I, that's when the police officer killed nobody. That was, uh, you not watching, protecting your kids at three years old. And they, when they came, the little kid, three year old, can't defend them. So that, that's a story that, that I agree that, that, um, you know, uh, black people in the community as a whole need to take, uh, more thought about how do we really watch our kids and do we really protect our kids because if was, they're kept not maybe by white people or something, there would have been all kinds of outrage. But this right here is just nonsense. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's nonsense. And I thank you for um, for getting that information. I cover the things I want to cover with you, ma'am, Miss Dorsey. And um, I'm going to let everybody know who watches this program. Please subscribe to the channel. My Your Journey channel name is uh, Shira Dorsey channel, YouTube channel as well. I'll put her link in the description box when you go to her channel and check the things out that she said that she wants to share this on YouTube channel. I'll make sure I put that link in there, Ms. Dorsey. You just share me the link that you want me to post up where people can watch that video you was telling about. And uh, I want people to subscribe to my channel as well and her channel as well too. And be also um, to purchase her book and um, to check out the other things, her websites as well and, and all her other platforms as well. Uh, right now is a good time to learn, educate ourselves about things that's going on in our society and uh, pay more attention to things as if it was a uh, a music video or a trick video or uh, whatever we give our attention to, a sports video. That's some, and right now is the time to pay attention to things of this nature because ain't nothing wrong with entertaining, but I think sometimes it's uh, us people of color, black people, we indulge in too many things that's not beneficial to us to help us to further our daily lives, ain't nothing wrong with entertainment, but I think it's important that we understand living within this country that there are obstacles to we have to be prepared to face. Even if you go into a, we uh, like entertainment, you know, come back home, get back, going to work, coming home, or where you may be coming from, a sports game, whatever, the things that we got to do to educate ourselves to get home safely. So we can't do the things we enjoy doing. It's not wrong with entertainment, but like I said, I think a lot of times we indulge ourselves in lack of educating ourselves about things and situations, real situations, and not being pulled and tossed and fro with the media, with our emotions about what's going on. We take the critical things and see how we should uh, handle the situation, think clearly and do research about what's really going on. So we say things that make sense and won't be saying stuff that's dumb and irrational, uh, which is not helping. Uh, Ms. Dorsey, anything you'd like to say before we close uh, to the audience and people who may be watching? I just want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to come on and speak to your listeners. And for anyone who wants to know more about me, you can visit my website, www.sgtcheraldorsey.com.
dot com, and that's Cheryl C H E R Y L Dorsey D O R S E Y, and Sergeant is abbreviated S G T. So you can uh, follow me on Instagram S G T Cheryl Dorsey. Follow me on Twitter S G T Cheryl Dorsey, and then on YouTube is S G T Dorsey Speaks. My book, Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate, is available for purchase if you want an autograph copy on my website. You can also read the very first chapter in its entirety on my website. And if you just uh, want a garden variety version, you can get it on Amazon.com. So thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, too, Miss uh, Miss Dorsey. And I really appreciate this uh, and giving us all the information that's very helpful. I want to thank you and I want to continue. I uh, hope you continue your journey, continue to do the things that you're doing. And um, man, I'll be looking forward to see uh, your upcoming projects and what you have in the future because you have put in a lot of great work out there on social media and in your books. So thank you, Ms. Dorsey, for coming on. I'll make sure I share all the information on your platform, on my platform. Uh, and, um, thank you for everything and thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate this time. I thank the audience for tuning in. Please subscribe, please share this video. Please go to her channel, subscribe to her channel as well. And thank all of the viewers that I have and uh, future viewers as well. Thank you and um, have a great day. Thank you, Ms. Doris. And be thank safe you. for holidays. Thank you. You as well. All right, bye.